Hello everyone. It's Friday of last week before finals. Um, you got exam two coming up. Uh, very, very close. Um, and this is uh, maybe one of our last big uh, robust opportunities and spaces for doing some re exam review. Um, and anything that is related to uh, formal logic, uh, the formal logic stuff from chapter six, and all this inductive argument stuff from chapters eight, nine, ten. Um, we are not doing exam three, as I've been talking about. Um, it is, uh, I will be sending out a sort of a packet of curriculum um, I'm going to make available to everyone. That sort of is the stuff we would have done if we were able to do it. I, I, as I said in the last weekend update email, I, I still want everyone to be able to have access to the curriculum because uh, it's valuable curriculum. And we'll, we'll do what we can next week. Um, I'm going to use our... Uh, our day of class, official last day of class is Monday, so we'll use class day on Monday and um, our final, our finals period, our officially assigned finals period, as a space for just doing a little bit with the informal fallacies, which is the sort of the what exam three would have covered. But I, I even that'll just be a, we'll be able to scratch the surface with that, um, and I want to give you the full curriculum uh, and make that available to you. So stay tuned. There'll be more. Uh, coming down the pipe on that, um, but there isn't going to be an official exam three. Exam two is it. So you got that this weekend, and then I will be turning around the grades for that exam uh, within 24 hours of having it completed, and then uh, you'll have during finals week the the sort of last thing to be considering for the class are the optional makeup exams if you want to do those. So uh, this space is wide open for whatever we want to use it for. Um, I do have the uh, study guide for um, exam two uh, locked and loaded, ready to go. I've got the homework exercises for eight, nine, ten, ready to go. I can screen share those as uh, it's relevant. Um, but I, I want to put it to all of you about how we use our time because I think you are your um, direction is how we use the time most efficiently. Uh, you know better than I do about what stuff is still sticky um, and that ne stands in need of some clarification. Um, we can do that either through talking over concepts on the sort of theoretical principled level more. I'm really happy to do that if there's still questions we can clear up there. And we can maybe do this a little bit through looking at homework problems and doing review there and diagnosing um, how things went with the homework. So balls in your court to, to direct our attention to places and please please do that and I'll follow your lead and again if you want to use the the microphone as a way to communicate um, you're very free to do that that is totally okay as well or you can put stuff into the chat so Nathan wants to do some chapter 10 yep I think that could be good mm-hmm Nikolai wants to do that too Okay. Exercise three, problem one. So let me get the screen sharing going here. Whoop. What's going on here? Uh, come on. A general overview of chapter eight and nine would be nice. Um, okay, um, that'd be a lot to do, um, but maybe we can we can do a little bit of that. Chapter ten, exercise two, problem three. Okay, cool. Um, let me know when the um, the homework exercises are popping up for you on the video. Popping up? Okay, cool. All right. Um, okay, so Nathan wanted to do um, 
some stuff here from inference the best explanation. Um, I'd like to do that. We haven't uh, most of our time this week uh, has been preoccupied with chapters eight and nine, um, so I think it might be good to to do some work here on chapter ten. Um, and, but uh, uh, Nathan, or I'm sorry, who do 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 do? Nikolai wanted to do uh, chapter nine, exercise three, problem one. Um, that is this one. Problem one right here. So this SCT, NCT stuff, is that right? Yeah, okay. All right, let's just do this really quickly, and maybe this will help for what you're looking for, Parker. Um, so this is the Chapter 9 stuff. Um, let, let's, let's do a little bit of this. So with Chapter 9, again, we're trying to test hypotheses of what is necessary and sufficient for other things. And uh, so we've got these two tests, the necessary condition test and the sufficient condition test, that give us instruction about how to analyze observational data to figure out the patterns of what it's telling us about how the world works. Claims about sufficiency and necessity are about the rules of the causal matrix of reality. Um, how are these, which things cause which other things? That's, that's what it's all about. So when we're testing sufficiency, with sufficiency, we're wondering um, whether a candidate condition is all it takes in order to make some target condition happen. With these A, B, C, D, G problems, the candidate conditions are A, B, C, and D, and the target condition is G. So if I'm wondering whether A is sufficient for G, um, what the SCT tells me is that I need to look for whether there's any evidence that disproves that statement. Are there any cases where A is present, the candidate condition is present, and G is not? If that ever happened, then that would prove that A is not all it takes to make G happen. And we don't have any counterexamples like that. So A passes the SCT for G. B fails because of case 2. Case 2 is a counterexample. Here you've got B, but no G. So that proves that B is not all it takes to make G happen. It's not sufficient for G. C is doing okay, no counterexamples there, uh, but D... Uh, has a counterexample here in case two as well. So the answer for this would uh, be uh, for these ABCDG problems on the exam. I'll be asking you for what fails the SCT for for G, and you and which cases cause them to fail. So you would say B fails because of case two, and D fails because of case two. Now for the NCT, we're wonder, wondering whether these candidate conditions are necessary for the target condition to happen. And the, the case that the NCT is telling us we need to look out for as something that would disprove those hypotheses are cases where you have the target, but you don't have the candidate feature. So um, that would if that happened, that would prove that you can get Gs without the candidate. We don't have any cases like that for A, so A passes the NCT, but we do have that for B. Case 3 is a counterexample. Here, you don't have B, but you do have G. So that shows that you can have a G without a B. So that means B is not necessary for G. No counterexamples for C. D, we, we do have a counterexample, also case 3. So the answer for this would be that B fails the NCT for G because of case 3, and D fails the NCT for G because of case 3. So there you go. How's, how's that uh, going? Going down. So the SCT, the, the Nikolai says, um, so the SCT looks whether it's possible for the A to be true but B false. Uh, not B, because uh, at least if you're meaning B in this case. Um, uh, uh, Nikolai, yeah, your, your A's and B's we probably want to cash out here just to make it clear. Because um, we're talking about A's and B's in these problems. So I'm going to translate your, your comment a little bit here. Okay, so you're saying, so the SCT looks whether it's possible for the candidate to be true but the target false. And the NCT looks to see whether it's possible for the target to be true, but the at the same time that the candidate is false. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I would recommend just doing another little translation of instead of talking about true and false, thinking about that it's true that it's present, or it's false that it's present. So translate true as the feature is present, and false as the feature is absent. And I think that's going to serve you better. Um, with these ABCDG problems, 
the true and false because the logical symbol here probably makes some sense. But when you're getting to something like, say, this problem, the word problem, then I think it's much more useful to be thinking about this in terms of a, a feature being present or absent. Um, in a case of the new CPU is a case of not the old CPU. The old CPU is absent in case 10, for example, here. Um, I think that's going to serve you a little bit better. Um, Dania, I saw you were typing, and then uh, did, you, did you have something you wanted to ask? Okay, okay. All right. Um, I, I want to move on because, like I said, we, we have spent a lot of time this week talking about um, SCT and NCT, and there's a lot of other stuff here to go over as well. So um, we wanted to do, what one was it? Uh, do um, exercise, or chapter 10, exercise 2, problem 3. Okay, so that was this one uh, about Columbus Day. Um, okay, so if this was on the exam, we'd have um, uh, just, we're just, we have an explanation being offered, there's some stuff to be explained, and then there's the stuff that is explaining it, the hypothesis that's supposed to be the story about why the stuff to be explained happened. So our explanandum and our explanons, if you remember those terms. So what's the stuff to be explained in question three? Uh, the hypothesis doesn't need to be explained. Um, Dania says why no one is in the room. Yeah, the observation is, is that I don't, well, we should maybe put it this way. I don't see anybody in the classroom, even though we usually have class at this time in this room. That's the stuff to be explained. Why am I not seeing anyone, even though I'm used to this happening? I, it's going against the way of uh, what I expect. Yeah, they, why they don't see anyone in the room. That's right. And the hypothesis that's being offered to explain it is that it's Columbus Day. Okay, so um, the, the, it's a very important to make sure that you've got those things identified properly. On the exam, there's only going to be one problem here for inference the best explanation. Be, just because it takes so much time to do these, um, I wasn't going to have multiple ones, I'm just going to just have one. And in the past, sometimes students have mixed up what thing is the thing to be explained and what stuff is, is the hypothesis that it is explaining it. And you, and you want to be really careful about that. Make sure you've got it right. Um, one tip here for making sure you've identified it properly is that the, if there is a, a word like because, what follows the because is going to be the hypothesis. I mean, that, that will definitely help. Um, the, the other thing that will help here is that the observations are sort of like the givens. They're the things that are obviously true, that there isn't any dispute about. Um, it's very clear that, you know, what, what's the thing that's obvious here? That I don't see anyone in the classroom. That's not really being problematized, right? That's not the thing that there's doubt or uncertainty about. The question is why it's happening. The thing that is the hypothesis may be something also pretty obvious, but um, it, it's, the, it's not the target of what we're trying to understand. The observation is going to, the stuff to be explained is the stuff we're trying to understand. Um, and so we're going to make, we're going to tell some sort of story about that. So the hypothesis is the story we're telling about the stuff that is kind of in our face, if that, if that makes sense. Um, the other uh, thing I want to emphasize about this fact that there's only one problem on the exam. Um, this is kind of important. Um, with all of these inductive arguments on the exam, I'm requiring you to address every standard. So in the instructions as they're printed here, for each of the following explanations, specify which standard of a good explanation, if any, it violates. So these printed instructions tell you only to bring up the things that are violated. Um, in the instructions that I sent out for this exercise, I kind of alerted you to the fact that on the exam, this will not be the instructions. I will ask you to evaluate the explanation using all of the standards. And so I've chosen a problem um, for the exam that where it's 
it's possible to do that like there's something useful or meaningful to say about all of the standards with respect to that situation um, so you'll need to address every one of them uh, I will be grading your answers based on that I'll be looking to have you touch on each one of the standards the seven standards we have for a good explanation um, and to uh, demonstrate basically your understanding of that principle or criteria through your explanation of your answer. So the fact that there's only one problem means there's one shot for you to kind of show me that you know what each of these standards is asking for. Um, is that making sense, everyone? As I said yesterday, some of the homework problems seem more tailored to putting the attention on some of these standards over others. The exam problem even though it's not going to give you a ton of facts or details or context, it's a kind of matter where there is plenty of opportunity to um, to discuss uh, each each standard that is, that we have. How's everyone doing? I'm I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Am I am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. So in problem three, we've got the hypothesis and we've got the stuff to be explained, identified. Now the question is, how good of a story is it? So first question, first standard is, does it have a story to tell? And this was a matter of just, it, it, the, uh, if there are multiple things to be explained, is the hypothesis being offered? Does it have a story to tell about all the stuff to be explained? No, no, no. That's the next standard. D depth is the second standard. Like, this is just like, is it trying? Um, Nathan, are you referring to, uh, when you say, I, I didn't see, does it have story to tell? What, what do you mean? You just mean it's not trying? Are you looking at just the text, the textbook itself, or are you looking at my lecture notes? Okay, so that one, um, I, I put the language in there of that the book uses about does the hypothesis really explain the observations? Um, I'm calling that story to tell. That's how I've been talking about it in all of my lectures. Because the, the real thing that's relevant here about this standard is that if there are multiple things to be explained in the stuff to be explained, um, then a better explanation would be able to explain all of them instead of just some of them. Like in the example I used in the lecture before about going to the doctor with a list of symptoms, those are the observations. And then the doctor is going to be like, I think this is your diagnosis. Um, their diagnosis, their hypothesis of what your medical condition is that would explain those symptoms is going to be better if it explains all the symptoms versus if it only explains some of them. Um, so in the other note here about story to tell is that because this is what it's getting at, if there's only one thing to be explained and they're throwing a hypothesis at it, then this standard is sort of trivially passed. It's doing a good job on this standard if there's only one thing to be explained and they're throwing something at it. And here, <clears throat> there's kind of two things I would pick out as what is there to be explained that I don't see anyone in the classroom. That's one. But the other thing is that I don't see anyone in the classroom in the context here that we usually have class at this time in this room. So that's kind of another feature here that they need to be uh, sort of addressing in the explanatory story that's being offered. And it might be a bad story, but it needs to at least have a shot. And I think the hypothesis that it's Columbus Day works, works for this. Um, okay. Um, so uh, next, next question. Is it deep? That's the second standard. So if, uh, remember the technique here for evaluating this is assume that the hypothesis is true and then ask yourself if you'd expect automatically that the stuff to be explained would happen. So let's say it was Columbus Day. Would you expect to not see anyone in the classroom even though you normally have class at that time in that room? Yeah. 
and y. Okay, so um, if that's your uh, background assumptions with this, then um, then yeah, it's not a deep, it's not a deep story. Yeah. Yep. Is that what everyone else is thinking too? Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm no. What are you thinking, Andrew? I'm double checking, but I think some schools do have Columbus Day observed off. Yeah. So this is a this is a great example of how background assumptions can really affect the analysis. If you've got a different idea of what is up with Columbus Day, then you might find this a deep explanation when other people might not. Um, the the what I'm aware of here is that. Columbus Day has at times, especially more in the past, been observed as a like uh, a holiday for like state employees and people have time off and stuff like that, um, like other national holidays. Uh, but that nowadays it really depends where you're at, <laughs> kind of like what state you're in in America, um, of whether that it is observed or is not observed. So it might depend on your background assumptions of where are we, like. Uh, would we observe this or not? In fact, uh, more recently, a lot of people have specifically not observed Columbus Day, sort of in protest of it. <laughs> I kind of agree with that. Um, I, I, the the idea of like there's nothing to celebrate here <laughs> is sort of a compelling one to me personally. Um, but yeah, if you if you've got different background assumptions about this, then you might make for a different evaluation, and that's okay. As long as you explain your answer on the exam, I can see that even if you have different background assumptions than me, that you're using this standard appropriately. So if it is if it is understood that you live in a place, yes, Daddy, uh, yeah, Indigenous Peoples Day, yeah, I like that as a replacement. Um, if you uh, live in a place, even if you disagree with it. If you live in a place where you know it's the expectation that Columbus Day is like a, a holiday that everyone takes off, then knowing that it is, or assuming that it is Columbus Day would entail the observations. So it would be a deep explanation in that situation. Even if you were sort of ethically opposed to it, it still is like what's going to happen, perhaps. Um, so that's depth. Next question, power. Can it? Can this hypothesis be powerful? In other words, is it capable of explaining other things? Background assumptions are going to be in play here. Other things outside of what is being presented, like banks being closed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or like the post office. Yeah. And this is why I said background assumptions are still going to be in play, because if you're in a context where Columbus Day is observed, then this could be explanatory for other things, too. 
that are not right immediately on the table to be explained that are presented in the problem that you're analyzing. But if you don't think that it's observed, then you wouldn't treat this as particularly powerful, right? That definitely cuts down on the, the power of it. Mm hmm Yeah, that's right, Nathan. That's yeah, that's what I'm that's what I'm going for. We're on the same page about that. Um, okay, so how about falsifiability? What if um, what if so, so with falsifiability, the way to approach it is to take the stuff to be explained, the observations, and imagine the opposite of it. So this mean this doesn't mean that you should be thinking it's not Columbus Day. What happens there? That would be to invert the hypothesis. We need to invert the observations. So the opposite of I don't see anyone in this classroom would be I do see people in this classroom. Okay. That would be that would be the key. Um, so can I use the same hypothesis to explain the opposite? So if I did see a bunch of people in the classroom, could I explain that on the grounds that it's Columbus Day? Again, background assumptions are going to matter here, but you can kind of see how this works, right? Okay, so uh, Nate, just for those of you watching this on YouTube la later, Nathan said it's not falsifiable because it doesn't apply to every case in which people are not in class. Is that what you're saying? Did I get that right, Nathan? Hello? Um, I, I think I heard you right. Um, this answer would actually not be uh, a good one. Um, the explanation doesn't need to be able to explain every instance of not seeing people in classrooms. It just has to do it for today, right? So I have to imagine, what if I didn't see people today? I don't see people in the classroom. Can I explain that because it's Columbus Day? Or, I'm sorry, if I did see people in the classroom, I could explain it because it's Columbus Day. Today. No. Um, that wouldn't really make sense. Even under the assumption that uh, Columbus Day is being observed, right, with that background um, assumption. Oh, did I cut out? Can people hear me? How's the connection? Going okay? Good now? Okay, okay, okay. So, um, so yeah, uh, the the explanation being offered, like like say um, when I offer the explanation um, that oh I don't know. Um, when my students asked me for why I have a limp, um, and I said before I gave the not deep explanation that I had too much fun last night or something like that, let's say I give a better explanation. I say, well, I was playing football and I jumped and put my ankle into a divot. That explains why I have a limp. The fact that that hypothesis is not capable of explaining every instance of a limp is not doesn't matter. That doesn't matter for falsifiability. Uh, in fact, that's probably a good thing if it doesn't work to explain every possible instance. Um, I mean, it could, you might want to have a really powerful explanation that could handle all the cases. That could be useful. But it might be that I, I want an explanation of the contingencies of how it happened in this particular case. Because I recognize, because of my background assumptions, that limps can happen for all sorts of reasons. It's not always because of twisting ankles in divots while playing football or something like that. So that would that'd be kind of barking up the wrong tree. Um, what you want to do for falsifiability is imagine the opposite of the observations and ask if the same hypothesis can be deployed to those observations, the, the opposite of those observations, and give an explanatory story. And you don't want it to work in that case. You want it to fail in that circumstance for it to pass the test of falsifiability. Um, okay, how about modesty? Is the hypothesis claiming more than it needs to in order to get the explanatory work done? Is there a weaker version of the hypothesis that could do all the same explanatory work? Okay. 
Just claim it's a holiday. Potentially. Oh, Danny is asking, wait, is it falsifiable? So I don't think it is. I mean, it, it, um, it is falsifiable under the assumption that Columbus Day is being observed, right? Um, that if I did see people in the classroom, that I could explain that on the grounds that it's a holiday. No, I couldn't do that. Um, so that would be a good, that would be drawing the line between what did happen versus what didn't happen. So that would pass the test of falsifiability. Um, Sam, I think you got a good point here for modesty, that we could just claim it's a holiday. We don't necessarily have to commit to it being Columbus Day. If we did want to commit to it being Columbus Day with that detail, that could be justified. If you think about the observations as not just a matter of that while we usually have class at this time in this room, I don't see anybody in this classroom and keeping in mind the context of what particular day it is. <laughs> um, then, then the detail that it's Columbus Day could be really helpful for that. Um, <clears throat> oh, Dania is still asking about falsifiability. But if it's not being observed, then it would not be falsifiable. Okay, let's talk about that scenario. So let's say you your background assumption is that Columbus Day is not being observed. Um, so it doesn't really work as a deep explanation. That's the first thing. So if there were people in the classroom, could you explain it because it's Columbus Day um, under that circumstance? Um, not, I mean, not really. It'd be like saying, um, be, I, I see people in the cla classroom. Well, let me think about this. Oh, I just got mixed up in my own head. <laughs> Falsifiability is a little tricky. Um, all right, so... Yeah, so let's let's switch it up a little bit, uh, like a, what I'm I'm thinking about it in my head here. If I'm thinking Columbus Day is not an observed holiday, then saying I don't see people in the classroom because it's Columbus Day is kind of like saying I don't see people in the classroom because it's I don't know March fifteenth or something, right? Um, nothing sort of special about that. Um, <clears throat> so then, would it be falsifiable to say, well, I, I do see people in the classroom because it's March 15th. I mean, yeah, I guess technically <laughs> that does work. Um, but it, it's not, it isn't super explanatory. So this is, this is a little bit of an, an edge case, I guess. Um, maybe it's helpful to go back to thinking about what in principle falsifiability is trying to get at. So falsifiability is trying to get at the idea that a good explanation explains why what did happen did happen and why something else didn't happen instead. So if the explanation is already not deep, if it doesn't even explain what, why what did happen did happen, then its ability to draw the line between why what didn't happen didn't happen is also going to be pretty weak. Does that make sense? Does that help, Dania? I mean, the, the exam problem that I have designed is going to be way more straightforward than this scenario that we're sticking, that we're trying to unpack right now. I think it, on the exam problem, if you take the opposite of the observations and ask, can I use a hypothesis? Would it work just as equally in that case too? You'll get a pretty definitive answer. Does that mean it's falsifiable either way? I, I'm thinking it's not doing a good job on falsifiability if it's also not deep. It's very hard to, if a, an explanation is not very deep, it's sort of insufficient as an explanation, then um, it makes it really hard to evaluate falsifiability, that it's going to be doing anything good on that. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it's a little confusing. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, I do, and I and like I said, just to kind of help with any, any concern or fear about for the exam here, I think the exam problem that I've designed is is m much more, um, if, if you understand what's going on in principle and you apply that principle into the scenario, I think you'll get a pretty clear result. I, it, it was designed specifically to do that so it, it wouldn't get super goofy. Okay. Um, all right, so modesty, I think, yeah, maybe we could uh, say it could be more modest by just saying that it's a holiday, <clears throat> but maybe the extra detail is 
worthwhile, it's useful if, if we're thinking about what particular day we're trying to explain the absence of everyone in the classroom. The fact that it's Columbus Day would be sort of just entailed by what day it happens to be. How about um, simplicity and conservativeness? Is accepting this explanation, believing this hypothesis, require you to believe something new that you didn't believe before? Do you acknowledge the existence of something or some phenomenon or power that you weren't previously aware of? I think the answer here is no. We already know Columbus Day is a thing. That's nothing new. Unless you weren't aware of Columbus Day and you're like, it's like a make up some holiday. You're like, wait, there, that holiday exists? <laughs> you might, might, that might be a thing that would be something new for you. Um, but this is probably doing fine on that. In terms of conservativeness, does accepting this hypothesis uh, contradict anything I previously believed? Well, this where the things about the background assumptions about whether Columbus Day is being observed or not is very relevant. Um, maybe accepting this as an explanation goes against what you thought you knew about what's going on here. Like, um, Andrew, you're saying, like, I need to look this up, but I think the way Columbus Day works is like this. Accepting the hypothesis might go against what your pre-theoretical background assumptions are about what, what's happening with Columbus Day, and so there could be tension there or not. It depends on your background assumptions. If you already have a background assumption that Columbus Day is being observed, then accepting this hypothesis doesn't require you to change anything about your background assumptions, so it would be conservative. I kind of want to do another problem from this exercise um, and just run through the standards really quickly to do another demonstration. I mean, we've talked about some of these scenarios before in the when I was doing the lectures to like explain stuff, um, but um, <clears throat> let's do um, let's do let, let's just run through seven really, really, really fast. This one's much more straightforward and in your face. So. Although I fished here all day, I didn't catch any fish because there are no fish in the whole river. So the hypothesis is that there are no fish in the river. The stuff to be explained is that I didn't catch any fish even though I was fishing here all day. So does it have a story to tell about that? Yep. I mean, there, there isn't anything in the stuff to be explained that the hypothesis isn't targeting for explanation. So it passes pretty, pretty trivially, unproblematically. Is it deep? Well... If, um, there, if I assume that there are no fish in the whole river, that the hypothesis is true, would I expect to not catch any fish no matter how long I fish there? Yep. So this is a perfectly deep explanation. Is it powerful? Could I use the fact that there are no fish in the river to explain other things? Yeah, I might be able to explain why there are so many bugs around or why I haven't seen much other wildlife because, you know, like no bears or things like that. Maybe they, you know, if there were fish, they're... That would attract other animals to the river. Um, there, those are there are maybe other things that would be able to explain uh, that could be explained by this hypothesis that there are no fish in the river. And and again, there's usually almost always some sort of power for every hypothesis. And as long as you just explore that in your answer and let me know that you know what power is, then I can give you credit for it. Okay. And then, um, is it falsifiable? Okay. Well, let's say. There were a bunch, I did catch a bunch of fish, the opposite of the stuff to be explained. I catch a bunch of fish. Can I explain that on the grounds that there are no fish in this river? No, clearly not. That will fail as an explanation if things were different. And so that is falsifiable, and that means that's a good explanation. Okay? We don't want the hypothesis to work if something different happened instead. So this is, this is a really much better example of falsifiability and how that standard, how you would apply that standard to get a meaningful result in your analysis. This one is, you take that general technique, apply it into this one, and it's much more unproblematic um, than the other one that we were talking about. Is it, um, okay, cool, awesome, I'm happy that's working for you, Nathan. Now, is it modest? Well, there might be some modesty problems here because... Maybe we don't need to say there are no fish in this whole river. Maybe we just need to say there aren't any fish in this part of the river, the river where I've been fishing. Maybe I need to go to a different part of the river, and that's where the fish are. 
Um, so maybe I don't need to make a claim about the whole river. That might be a little overkill. Um, okay, so um, I think there's some issues here with modesty. How's it doing on simplicity? Um, is accepting the hypothesis adding something new to my sense of reality? And not really, right? It does. I I already believe in fish and rivers, so the existence of those things is pretty trivial. Um, there's no like new type of subatomic particle or something. Um, so I believe in fishes and rivers. And do I believe that there are rivers that don't have fish? Yes. It's not like every river's got fish. So this is the idea that's being appealed to to explain the scenario is not an unfamiliar one or one that I don't previously accept as being possible. So it's doing fine on simplicity. It's doing good on simplicity. How about conservativeness? Um, is accepting the hypothesis that there are no fish in this river going requiring me to give up any of my previous beliefs or is it intention or contradiction with any of my previous beliefs? And here there's some opportunity. If I'm thinking about this as a real life scenario, I mean you don't know which river this is and you don't have much context about it. But you can imagine, I mean just think about the plausible context for this. If I previously did believe that there were fish in this river, then why did I come here and fish? <laughs> if there, if I thought that there were no fish here, why did I come to fish? Does that make sense? This is actually, uh, this point that I'm making about this problem, I think is a really good wink, wink, nudge, nudge thing to be thinking about for the exam question. Because um, you're not going to have a lot of context on the exam question, um, but you can piece it together in sort of thinking about what is the a likely or plausible backdrop for what's going on here. If the speaker who's talking here already believed that there were no fish in this whole river, then why would they come here to fish? Presumably, if they came here to fish, it's because they thought there are fish or there might be fish in this river. Maybe they fished here before and they found fish, right? So for them to accept this hypothesis under these circumstances might be a changing of their background assumptions. Right? They're going to give up the belief that there were fish in order to accept this new belief. Oh, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe there are no fish. Does that make sense, everyone? That's a that's a really important thing I wanted to share for how to think about conservativeness. I think that that's going to serve you well. Yeah, so <clears throat> remember, thinking about conservativeness is a matter of comparing accepting the hypothesis against your background assumptions. And in a case like this, a problem like this, where you're not given a ton of context, you don't know the river, you don't know what's going on with the speaker's background assumptions, this sort of thing, you might have to extrapolate what is sort of likely or plausible here. So I'm thinking, what are the background assumptions of the speaker? They know the river better than me. Like, I don't know what river we're talking about. If, they, if this was really going to be a conservative explanation. That means that the belief that there are no fish in this whole river is not in conflict or in tension with any previous beliefs. But this seems weird. If they really already believed that there were no fish in this river, then why did they come here to fish? The mere fact that they fished here all day indicates to me that they've got some background assumptions that either there are fish in this river or there are likely fish in this river. Otherwise they wouldn't have come. So if they're now accepting the hypothesis that there are no fish in the river as a way to explain why I didn't catch any fish, that's probably meaning that they are changing their background assumptions. They're kind of going back on what they thought previously and taking a different turn. They're, instead of thinking that maybe there are fish in this river, now they're like there are no fish in the river. That's changing their background assumptions. In order to accept this hypothesis, they have to change their other beliefs, and that means it's not conservative. Ideally, we have an explanation for the observations that doesn't require changing our view of what's going on, doesn't require changing any of our beliefs. Making sense to you, Sebastian? Cool. How's that going for everybody? Everybody else? Okay, cool. Um, we, we have a kind of, um, that was a bit to wrap my mind around. Um, okay, the, um, whenever you're evaluating simplicity and conservativeness, 
you'll have to think about background assumptions about what, what do we already believe about the world. And for both of them, a be the best kind of explanation doesn't require us to change or modify anything about how we are looking at reality. Whether that's accepting something new, like painting in some new part of that picture of reality, that's what simplicity is about, or having to erase something to, to accept this as an explanation, that, to change our beliefs. That's what conservativeness is about. And in a problem where you're not given a ton of context, you might have to do a little bit of anticipation of what is likely the reasonable beliefs of the person. And I think this is going to happen on the exam. So uh, in thinking about the, the relevant background assumptions for evaluating simplicity and conservativeness for the exam problem, you may have to speculate a little bit here about, uh, given the situation or the circumstances, what would be a reasonable assumption about background assumptions. So I just wanted to kind of alert you to that. Be prepared for that. Um, we've got a few minutes left here, and I, I'm kind of I, I want to talk about a uh, argument from analogy problem. So um, it might mean going a little bit over time here to do this, but I, I want to get it into the video. If you have to go, maybe come back and watch the very tail end of this video. Um, let me give you the code word. Um, code word today is going to be um, how about post-colonialism <laughs> post-colonialism there you go there that's the uh, that's the code word for today um, a little more complicated but um, but yeah I want to I want to get in uh, if anyone can stick around and can and uh, listen to and ask questions about this uh, ar an argument from analogy problem. I think I'd like to get that in today as more help for preparing for the exam. So, um, which uh, which problem from this would be uh, chapter ten, uh, exercise five? Is there a good one in there that people would like to hear me talk about? I can just choose one too. Okay, I'll just do that. Let's do the Siamese cat. Number two. Oh, uh, seven. Oh, okay, seven's very complicated. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do number two, and then Sandia, if you want to stick around and talk about seven, we can do that a little bit too. All right. So, um, okay. So number two, my aunt had a Siamese cat that bit me. So this Siamese cat will probably bite me too. So the disputed case is this Siamese cat. That's the one that the conclusion is about. We've got this nice argument marker, conclusion marker, to let us know about that. And the analogous case is my aunt's Siamese cat. And the property in question is sort of tendency for biting behavior. <laughs> so because my aunt had a Siamese cat, that uh, engages in biting behavior, therefore this Siamese cat will probably engage in biting behavior too, something like that. Maybe I'm getting a little overly technical for it, but let's do that. Um, that'll be, I think, tendency for biting behaviors, a disposition for this is, is actually going to be helpful for some of these other standards, but um, that's the property in question. That would be like the property X in the diagram. What are the cited similarities? What makes these two cases similar in other respects other than what we're making the conclusion about. Um, well, one of them's a cat, the other one's a cat, so they're both cats, that's one thing. And they're also both Siamese cats. And that is about all that we've got to work with. <laughs> I mean, those are the only things that make these two scenarios similar to each other, uh, or analogous. So that's not much to go off of, but you can still do everything that you need to do to evaluate these. So the first question, are the cited similarities relevant to the property in question? And we have to approach them each individually. Um, does the species of animal, is that relevant to its tendencies for biting behavior? Yes. I, it, even at just one level, we could explain that as saying, like, does it even have the ability to bite you? Right? Like some, some animals or creatures don't even have the ability to engage to bite at all, much less have a tendency for it. Um, some animals are going to be more likely to bite, and others maybe less. 
Um, and that's just going to be a part of their psychology, um, their instincts, that kind of thing, their, their evolutionary history. So the species definitely matters. How about the breed? So the fact that they're Siamese, um, is that relevant to the biting behavior? Well, I've got background assumptions that say yes. Um, we talk about different breeds of cats and dogs as having different tendencies in terms of their uh, behaviors, their behavioral patterns. Um, they have kind of personalities, and it's not universal, but there, is, there are some broad generalities about that that would make there to be a relevant connection between those things. Okay, so that's relevance. We're just looking at each of the cited similarities and interrogating, is there some thread of connection that makes it relevant to the property in question? If so, what is it? So far, so good? People in chat? That feeling all right? Awesome. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. Now, are the cited similarities important to the property in question? That is, are they the, the things that are being cited that are relevant? in the cited similarities, are they at the top of the list? Are they some of the things that are the most centrally determining factors for determining whether something is has, gonna have the tendency to bite you? You kinda need to think with your background assumptions about what are all of the things that you think are meaningful variables here that could be involved in determining biting behavior? And is the, the species of animal and the breed of it uh, relevant, are, are, are those relevant things at the top of the list of things that are going to be important in influencing this. Um, what, do you, what do your background assumptions say? They may have relevance, but it's kind of like how relevant, right? And you, you, you might have some different background assumptions about what's going on with these animals. Um, and as long as you can kind of explain your evaluation using your background assumptions in a way that I know you understand in principle what importance is about and what makes it different from relevance, then we'll, we'll be good here. Breeds tend to share common behavioral patterns as a whole, so I think it's important. So, uh, Andrew, I would say this answer is about halfway there. The key thing for importance is comparing those connections with other other variables that could also be significant in determining the property in question. So there, there'd have to be some kind of comparison with things outside of just the connection that's being made here. The, the, that breeds tend to have common behavioral patterns is the basis of its relevance, um, but we have to kind of compare that with other possible variables like the wider circle of considerations to be able to make a judgment about importance. So if you, Andrew, if you thought something like the behavioral patterns of an animal are primarily determined by the breed, that would make it important. So Sandia says, does individual personality matter here? Um, potentially, depends on your background assumptions here. If you're like, uh, it's kind of nature versus nurture, right? If you think the, the history with the animal has a bigger factor in determining whether it has biting behavior than what breed it is, then you would say the breed is not as important of a factor. So Sam says attitude, personality may be a better indication. Um, Sam, I, I like your answer okay here. I think there's a danger that talking about the attitude and personality is just exactly what it is we're trying to figure out, right? The biting behavior is just the character of the cat. So if you're going to say, well, the biggest factor that determines whether this creature is going to bite me is whether it's going to bite me. That that'd be a little empty, right? Dania says domestic cats don't usually bite humans without any triggers, and we don't have any info about that. Um, so that's a background assumption that you have um, that might make it that um, the fact that your aunt's cat was Siamese and a cat uh, is not going to be a major factor in determining it's biting behavior that's going to take special circumstances to bring a cat into biting behavior so that might make you think that those features are not very important does that make sense okay cool just to kind of bring it back to like the main bottom line point here in testing importance you have to take each of the cited similarities and kind of compare it against things that are not given to you in the problem you have to anticipate things that are not in the problem using your background assumptions. What are all the factors that, if you're just like, 
I'm going to say here are the main variables that determine whether something's going to bite you or not, whether, whether it has a tendency for biting behavior. What would that list look like? And would the ones that the problem is mentioning be at the top of that list? Or are there things that are more important than them? And some of the cited similarities might be more important, some might be less important. Um, wink, wink, nudge, nudge for the, home, for the exam problem. So you have to take them all individually. That's really important. Okay, finally, we have the standard of an absence of relevant disanalogies. So to test this, you want to say try to come up with some disanalogies. And again, the disanalogy cases need to be cases that are similar to the case in question, the disputed case. So they need to be similar to this cat, and they need to not have the property in question. So presumably you probably want to think about cats that you know that don't have a tendency for biting behavior that could be similar to this Siamese cat. Now you're not given a lot of details about this Siamese cat. You don't know anything about it other than that it's Siamese and it's a cat. But you might be able to anticipate some possible disanalogies here, and that's what I'd ask you to do on the exam as well. I'll just let you know right now, the exam problem is going to be about a person who I know personally, but you don't know personally. You don't know almost anything about this person, and you're going to be asked to make a judgment about them with respect to a particular thing. And if you don't know the facts of this person, you might think, I can't answer this question. And to a certain extent, you're right. Mm -hmm. But I want you to try to anticipate possibilities. So here's what it would look like. It's just a demonstration if this was the exam problem. Um, so I don't know about this Siamese cat. But there might be some things going on with this cat that would make it available for these disanalogies. Like this Siamese cat is well-fed. Um, it's well-loved. It's uh, part of a. It, it's owned by a family that has children, and uh, and so that might make it similar to some cats I know that are well fed, well taken care of, well loved, are in families. Maybe an indoor cat that don't engage in biting behavior. I have a lot of cats I've known in my personal experience that don't have biting behavioral tendencies that have those features. And if this Siamese cat shares those features then that would be a relevant disanalogy. Yeah, Sebastian, yeah, use your background knowledge and your imagination to come up with what could be possible disanalogies. And if you do that, even if you're not sure whether they stick in this exact case, they will still uh, allow me to know that you know what relevant disanalogies are all about. And oftentimes when people give you analogy, arguments from analogy, you may not have this kind of um, intimate background knowledge about the scenario, but you could still anticipate what you might want to follow up on if you were going to really take the analogy seriously, to investigate it a little bit more and to critically think about it. So this is still a very relevant thing to practice and, and have some training with. Um, so that's what you could do. You could also just be like, do I know any Siamese cats that don't bite? And if you've met some Siamese cats that don't bite, boom, you've got a disanalogy with this Siamese cat. All right, how's that going? Yes, Lucy, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, I just want to make sure this stuff about uh, argument from analogy is working for people. Three, since it's a longer problem. Um, yeah, we, we can do that. Um, this video is getting a little long for everyone on YouTube, too. Um, I would love to talk to people more about this. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just throw this on the video anyway. In case, and people, those of you on YouTube who are watching this, if you want to hear more about analogy, here's some bonus footage. i will put it that way. Okay. So um, we also had a request to talk about seven. Um, Cindy is still here in the chat, too. So you might want to do this one. It's definitely longer and much more complicated. We can do that. I also I sent out the answers, so I've you you've got some some examples from me about talking through these problems already that you can kind of review on your own. I definitely would want you to ask me if you've got any questions looking at my answers. Um, but um, Lucy, before before I lose this, what was your question about exercise three? Which chapter is this? Yeah, I can hear you. Are you talking about from chapter 9? Sorry to interrupt. 
Are you talking about the A, B, C, D, G problems? Okay, okay. No, that's wrong, actually. So let me clarify this for everybody uh, who, aren't, who isn't able to hear uh, what Lucy was asking uh, through the microphone. Um, so we're looking here about the example for exercise three. Th um, th these instructions are not the ones I'm going to have on the exam for the ABCDG problems, as I indicated in my instructions document, but it's kind of similar. I'll be asking which, if, uh, which of the candidates, A, B, C, or D, are eliminated by the sufficient condition test. Basically, which candidates fail the sufficient con condition test, and what are the counterexamples that prove that they fail. And then there'll be a B section that says which uh, of the candidates fail the NCT, the necessary condition test, and what are the cases that serve as counterexamples that rule them out. I will not ask you for which ones pass both or, or something like that. We'll, we'll just stick to it this way. Um, and but uh, what Lucy was asking is, do you need to do this for each case individually? And the there's a little bit of a misunderstanding there. Um, what you've got to do is look at all of the cases as kind of like a set. Okay, so uh, when you're say looking for whether something fails the SCT, that's a matter of given all of the cases, do any of the cases count as a counterexample as defined by the sufficient condition test? So as long as there's just one case, like say case one, that causes A, the, the hypothesis that A is sufficient for G to fail. It's not like it's passing in cases two and three. Whether it passes or fails is a matter of taking into account all of the observational data that we have. So if it fails anywhere, it fails everywhere. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, the microphone's not coming through as well right now. Um, barely. Here, I'll turn up my volume a little bit. Can you say it again? Yes. What I'm saying is that, um, yeah, the whether it fails or not is just about whether there are any cases that count as counterexamples. So for A here, Case 2 and Case 3 are not counterexamples, but Case 1 is. And that's all it takes in order for A to be proven to not be sufficient for G. Here, here, here's another thing that might be important, to, or a way to explain what's going on here. If I'm claiming that some candidate is sufficient or necessary for some target, I'm talking about the general rules of causality that kind of apply all the time. So even um, so if we're saying uh, cutting off my head is a sufficient condition for killing me, that's true even in cases where my head is not cut off, right? It's kind of like the rules of reality. This is how it's set up. <laughs> and sometimes it's in effect, like if my head is chopped off. But also even when my head is not chopped off, uh, it still happens. Or if I die through some other means, it's still true that if my head had been cut off, then I would die, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So if I'm trying to test my claims about how the general rules apply, a lot of times our general rules work in many situations, but then there's just those counterexamples where they don't work. For example, um, I've talked about this a little bit before, the history of science. Um, Newton put together these laws of physics, and they're awesome. I mean, they make sense in, in many, many cases. There are most of the circumstances we face in ordinary life, the sort of macro world. Um, Newton's laws don't have counterexamples. But as technology improved and we were able to observe more of the world, we, we were able to find counterexamples, usually on the context of the very, very small, or the very, very large, or the very, very hot, or the very, very cold, or high pressure and low pressure. And in those circumstances, Newton's laws don't work. They are contradicted by the observations. His claims about what is sufficient and necessary conditions for other things uh, are contradicted by the data, which means that they don't apply at all. That Newton's laws, it's not like Newton's laws 
are true for some parts of reality and then they're false for other parts of reality. We're like, Newton is trying to describe physics and he got it wrong. And we need to replace it with something else. And maybe it's not going to take that much of an adjustment. Like Newton is kind of mostly right here or, or on the right track. But it's still true that Newton's laws are not the universal laws that define how the world works. Um, that's a little more complicated example, but does that help illustrate what's happening here? Um, Sandia says, so it is sufficient to cut your head off to kill you, but not necessary. Yes, there are other ways for me to die other than for my head to be cut off. That's right. But what I'm what I'm trying to um, explain right now is how when we're when we're testing things with the sufficient condition test and the necessary condition test, the things we're testing are general statements to say that P is sufficient for Q or that P is necessary for Q is a claim about the general and universal rules of reality. And we're trying to scope out that pattern by looking at specific cases and seeing whether those, those cases are consistent with that pattern or not. And if any cases contradict it, those are counterexamples to the general rule, and that means that those general rules are not actually correct, that they're false. So do not approach the SCT and NCT as saying, like, for example, in this one, that in case one, uh, the S A fails the SCT, but in case two and three, it passes. If it fails anywhere, then that just means it fails. Something like uh, C. C does not have counterexamples for the SCT, so that means it passes. So it's just like testing for validity. If there is even one counterexample case, boom, game over for validity. It, only if there were no counterexample cases did we say the argument was valid. The same kind of game we're playing here with SCT and CT. Okay, wonderful, 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 wonderful. Happy that that is clear. All right, um, uh, I, I have to uh, get to a phone appointment with another student. Um, so maybe I, I would be great to do another one of these um, argument from analogy problems, but I think I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to stop the video now. And people, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at my answers. And then um, if you have questions about what I'm explaining in my answers, I can be wrong. I'm a fallible human being too. <laughs> so if there's anything goofy there, let's talk about it. Um, if you're confused by my answers or not sure about them, um, let's uh, call me up and, and we can talk today. I'm trying to make myself as available as possible over the next few days because I know you're going to be working on this exam. So um, please reach out. I will, I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. All right, good luck everyone. I'm here for you. Don't ever doubt it. Okay, hope to hear from you if I can be helpful. Bye-bye.